you uh, invited me to open this conference because there are so many more people who are much more in uh, C sound. But indeed, I have done different things uh, with C sound, and especially from the uh, performance perspective, I would like to share uh, some experience. And in a way, I think it, this is a very good sign that uh, C sound is not looking back. It's uh, looking ahead. So what, what can C sound become? Although it's really 30 years old, no, not so much how things have been done and what's in the past. So C sound is definitely very much alive, and it's incredible how we can use it. So I would like to talk a little bit my story in C sound and then <coughs> share some experiences, maybe give some inspiration. And the two main um, attentions I would like to uh, have in focus is um, not so much what I have done, but uh, first of all, why I have chosen these ways to do the things and uh, these tools. And then how, in fact, how it has influenced me to uh, working with these uh, tools um, is definitely also mm, it, um, it's important for what I do as a, an artist. And <coughs> the first encounter with C sound it came also from need. Once we were uh, performing uh, John Cage uh, theatre piece with my ensemble Ooh, who was six musicians, very fine uh, collective. And basically, the theatre piece it says that it has some durations and then rules and then so on. But basically, you need to do uh, some actions in given durations. And Cage also uh, says that everybody is what it is. Actor is actor, dancer is dancer, and the actions uh, done by these performers is the music. So it's not you don't create music, but you make sounds for the, your actions, and this becomes the music. Well. All of us, uh, six, we are musicians, so it wouldn't be that interesting uh, just to play our instrument. And we started to think, what else are we? And me, uh, I was interested in programming, and I thought, okay, is there a way I can use programming in that context? And then I got an idea to give a, a double twist to the Gage's idea that uh, actions become sounds. So I needed something that um, I write down what other performers do, and their actions should be somehow converted into sounds. So I needed to write some kind of program or script uh, that could do it for me. And I had heard uh, from an Italian friend uh, who had studied uh, C sound that exists such a crazy program called C sound and it's so complicated that uh, to make one beat you need to write one page of code and if you make one comma wrong then you get nothing. And uh, well it's it's partly true. It's not that bad. But uh, I saw I understood okay, very good, writing text so it can be scripted about. And I found uh, from internet some uh, materials because in Estonia nobody's well then was nobody teaching uh, C sound. And I had one week, learned something, and uh, wrote this uh, system. I hadn't touched it for uh, seven years now. But basically, it's a first script with some uh, uh, no, that's the wrong word. Some uh, predetermined instruments. So it has the typical season orchestra. And what the script does is that if you type in um, in some text, then it takes the, well it doesn't see much, but anyway, it takes the uh, characters, the <coughs> key codes of the letters, and then turns them into uh, calls to instruments. And so it was very basic things that came out, and then now when I had look uh, to this, uh, to these uh, lines, it is of course very uh, first try to do something. But at least I could get it working. 
Uh, I didn't use it all the time, so there was different, uh, different actions, but we, we did, as you can see, that we had all kinds of different things that we uh, made the sounds with. But anyway, um, even with this short week, I tried to understand a little bit of C sound. And it was one week I could at least something done. I got really interested in that program and I started um, uh, learning. Uh, independently. And of course, the C sound book uh, edited by Richard Boulanger was the main source. So I, uh, I went it through, mostly reading, also trying out some things, but, but it was much of thinking and trying to understand, and I learned also a lot about sound physics from, from that book. And uh, slowly started to try out things, and what interested me most at that time was, uh, again, such scriptable way of creating sounds, and so-called algorithmic programming, so that <coughs> you write down some rules, how your piece of music is going to happen. And of course you can ask that why would anyone want to have computer writing music? But um, in many situations it can be very useful if you work, for example, uh, for uh, sound installation or theatre or uh, film and the director says that, oh, I don't need five minutes of music, I need ten. And then you can change some parameters and, uh, and you get it. So I can let you play one piece I did then. Um, and it's well something that I'm well simple sounds, but, but still I'm quite uh, clear for that. And it's again a perm script. with instruments and different parameters. And basically, again, the script is uh, um, generating the score line. So, uh, but it was uh, thought through how and when things happen. And what it uh, taught me a lot was uh, thinking in, the, in uh, musical objects or sound objects, so that you have different shapes and different behaviors and different rules, how they uh, change and you think in proportions and then so on and then it uh, was very much helping for me also understanding the compositional side of many pieces I used to play. Well, I, I stop at example now. But then I stopped for quite some time because still um, then I was working as the season <coughs> book, as giving examples with a score and orchestra files differently and, and working in a command line and then if you make errors it takes time to figure out how and what went wrong. And so at some point I, I stopped and then left behind. And at some point somehow from the internet I uh, found uh, um, a link to a cute C sound that is called uh, C sound cute nowadays. And this was actually essential for me to, uh, to come back and to, uh, to continue learning and, and uh, continue with uh, um, text works. And especially uh, since um, Season Cute has uh, so many good things that can support you, uh, the manual that is, is, well, you can say built in, so you can easily uh, check out uh, information about opcodes, get examples. <laughs> At that time, uh, René uh, Jopi was uh, just uh, writing uh, the examples by Ian McCurdy uh, for season Q, so there's um, uh, famous McCurdy collection if you ever have used uh, season it's cute and uh, there's the dozens and dozens of great examples about different um, sound generation and manipulation ways and you can easily hear what you do and then try out with um, different parameters and then uh, it, it really helps to, to get you going uh, more uh, quickly. So, <coughs> and um, this way I fell in love with Season Cute uh, from that day. 
on and later and, uh, somehow I started to also contribute to CSUN Q to know on the, well basically the, the main developer of that further. Um, and but the things that interested me were still uh, connected with the very first um, idea that you create some kind of situation, some kind of rules, and then let things happen. And very important part uh, in my works is um, uh, so-called interactive works, or, or how we call them, uh, sound games. And uh, this piece we did in uh, CSUN conference in Hanover, uh, 2011. I, I created uh, from one concept uh, again with Ensemble U. We were doing uh, Stockhausen uh, microphony there. And then we needed some, some piece with electronic sounds again next to that. And uh, from some discussion with uh, our fellow musicians, we um, thought about the different roles of musicians and, and also playing in orchestra and then you are one a small part of a big machine and, and how it feels. And then I thought uh, to make a very clear model of that thing, that, that one person is a really like one bit uh, in this big machine or, or some, some part. Um, and how it still feels to make music. And how this piece is done, uh, it's using uh, switches, very simple uh, physical switches that are in the audience. And there are four groups of players, so uh, four players in every group. So uh, 16 people get to switch to play. And every group has a conductor. And this is actually a very important part. And this is the score of the conductor's line. And uh, the conductors need to conduct the group as musically as they can, to follow the tempos and rests and uh, give solos sometimes. And the, the tension of this piece, or the, the main idea, is it's where is the music? Um, so when the conductor is really giving uh, a lot of expression, you need to have this small switch and you do your best to somehow play Dolce <laughs> with it, then it's. Uh, it's, there is some good, nice contradiction in it already. And Seasound uh, was using uh, this information on and off, like bits, uh, for four channels and generating uh, sounds of the different uh, switch positions and the uh, speed of the changes and then and so on. I can play you a small um, example. The main thing is that the people are doing their things and then sounds come out and in the end you somehow feel that it somehow it influences something but how exactly it's impossible to understand. So you do your best to follow the conductor and then the things happen all from the uh, four speed. And then so on. And here um, the main thing is not the sound, so it actually makes really no sense to listen to it. Um, it's more about the action. Uh, so it's <coughs> the things that are the experience that people go through and the ideas that uh, this constellation of things uh, 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 rises and also uh, the thoughts that people might get. So it's, I think, quite awkward thing anyway that people at least at some point should start thinking that uh, why it's done, like, what was it? And if they don't sentence the, uh, my uh, initial idea that where is the music? Is it in the hand of the conductor? Or in the feeling uh, of the um, 
people who are playing? Is it their playing of the switches? Is it the sound that this machine, the computer, creates? So it's like an open thing. And uh, what is the most strong experience for the uh, uh, people in the audience? So it's, it's more about action, and so it's very hard to um, call the composition or a piece of music. So it's more a sound game. And uh, well, this became an uh, important thing for a couple of years. I started a series of so-called participation participation concerts, and there now the part of uh, quality of the sounds or um, uh, or the musical part of the sound games is a bit more important. But the uh, there was, uh, uh, I think, eight or nine concerts. Every concert had a, a certain subject, like uh, uh, sine waves, editing, synthesis, and, and, um, and beatings, for example. And then there were three parts. One is the sound game uh, uh, that I created for every single uh, concert. Uh, then a small lecture uh, where my friend uh, and some last is Talmud, you see in the middle picture, explained some things about theory, um, but in a very simple way that people would also get some knowledge about what's inside of, of pieces and compositions. And then uh, a couple of chosen pieces <coughs> for flute and electronics that, were, uh, uh, <coughs> that fit uh, to the program. And the main idea about the sound games there was um, to um, activate uh, the people in the audience so that they, they get excited and they can make sounds and that they can make music and uh, that they are somehow in the process already. And then you add some interests by their talk and then the people are also more active in listening. So what I was really after uh, to pull people out from this uh, comfortable uh, client uh, uh, like position that you buy your ticket and then you sit there and then hope that something <coughs> good is served for you. And I really um, um, believe that uh, uh, the audience, the people who are listening, are actually also creating the concert. So it's all very important what they contribute and uh, the way how to listen, this kind of circulation of energy or, or signal to what's in the air, it's, it's actually the most important or oh, one of the most important parts in the concert. Mm, and all these uh, sound games, the source uh, code is also up in GitHub. Later in the last slide, you can write down uh, the link if you like. And how it's done is always C sound uh, in behind. Uh, the people in the audience, they can use their uh, laptops or tablets or uh, smartphones and all they need to do is to go to one web page that ran from my computer so we had a local Wi-Fi network and then there were some, some very simple knobs or sliders and then they could do things. Mm, and then uh, the connection was via WebSocket uh, uh, protocol that came out a couple of years ago, a bit more, but, but then it's quite a new thing and not all browsers didn't support it. But anyway, it's a very handy way how to communicate with um, devices if you need to do uh, something uh, uh, that connects web sockets and, uh, for example, CSAN. And then I wrote a small program that is um, gathering the data um, coming from people and then redirecting it uh, to CSAN or starting the instruments. And so on. Um, I think we have time. I can show you a small, a small example about uh, <coughs> one process. <coughs> it's a piece uh, called Pattern Game. We did it also in St. Petersburg in uh, the last um, CISO conference. And uh, it was written for a uh, a uh, program of uh, subject delays, repetitions and delays, and what the audience could do, they could build some small melodies, 
uh, send it to the system to play. And then in some points, the system started to use different delay effects to, to uh, manipulate the sound. And also, I was reading uh, uh, the small melodies uh, from a screen and trying to play them or improvise on them. So it's just, just a small example how it worked. I'm not sure. This is not beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it doesn't want to scale that. Right? So. different section in that piece. But that's basically how it worked and it was a very nice club-like atmosphere in these uh, concerts and then there were many people who really got attached to it and then came back to almost every concert. But now uh, from the performance uh, side of view um, in, in kind of problem solving you know, uh, sides, uh, I've used also C sound in very um, <coughs> helpful uh, ways. And I would like to show you now one example uh, for one concert I was preparing um, a piece by Emanuele Casale, an Italian wonderful composer, well, well, younger generation, and of great music. And he has one piece uh, for. Uh, flute and then soundtrack and uh, it's, it should be quite well synchronized to work well and this is often the case when you have a piece for a soundtrack, a tape and then a, and a performer and well some of them are quite free and it doesn't matter so much but some must be really well together and it's always a tricky thing how to do that and well the composer says that you should learn it so well that you know exactly and then you play with that Thing. But still, it's very hard to do and, and, and also a little bit risky. But if you miss something, then you are just not so exact as the uh, tape actually requires. You could use a uh, click track in your ear, but I hate it. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's really bad uh, for a player just to have one, one ear blocked, or sometimes you, you have the, even the big, big one, and it's also somehow very awkward and they don't here really well. So I thought, hmm, can I have some kind of visual um, click track? And that's another subject we'll, we'll uh, talk about uh, uh, soon. Um, and another problem often for players, uh, uh, when you have your two hands um, on the instrument, then, and you have 10 pages of uh, score and very fast tempo, so what do I do? So you could have five pages and then you walk and then you play. Like mostly it works and then it's fine. But I was uh, thinking that uh, can I somehow make the computer do the two things that uh, give me the click track and also turn pages for me? And well, um, I'm using uh, now a pair of uh, C sound for a playback and uh, sending the, the click track and also a kind of graphical or video uh, software processing that's cross-platform, a very powerful uh, program that can do anything with uh, shapes and uh, images and, and, uh, and so on. So I'm using processing uh, for um, displaying the uh, sheet music and also um, drawing a, a small uh, bar on that beat, what it's playing. So I'll show you in a minute.
I'm sorry, the screen resolution of that um, projector is smaller than my screen, so you miss the lower, lower part. But uh, now, uh, this is the processing mm -hmm. screen. And then I use uh, CSOM next to it. And well, C sound then starts to play and sends OSC messages just off on every beat about the beat number to processing. And the processing then counts the place where the uh, rectangular cursor must be. But you'll see it in a minute, minute and uh, I'll play the piece for you. It lasts about five to six minutes. Thank <laughs> you. 
and I think it's great kids, and, and, and it really works if it's uh, 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 together. Well, later, let's leave also. So just well, what you're using there again, so you say there's processing as well as these sounds, and how, so how do they, what's doing what? And, and how, how are they working together? Like? Uh, C sound has a, a running metronome in, and every day it, it sends a mes message to processing, and then processing listens to the incoming messages, and every time the message comes in about the beat and bar number, then it draws and you know, it calculates the position of that frame and then draws it. Now, one example about using C sound again in the music making. And <coughs> one project uh, um, we, we did a couple of years ago. And, and now it's a question that, um, well, the C sound community, or often musicians who are far apart, uh, well, we often we meet in the mailing list and then so seldom and then physically, but is there ways how to uh, make music together? And the reason <coughs> how this idea came was um, uh, the CSUN conference in Boston uh, four years ago. And um, I couldn't come. I couldn't go there. And was thinking that there must be also uh, many more people who would be there but that cannot. And is there a way we can still somehow join our you know, global sea-sounding uh, uh, music making? And at that time, CSON 6 was just uh, uh, quite a new thing and that came just out. And one great feature in CSON 6 is that it can uh, recompile the code or compile new uh, code when it's running. So you put CSON running, and whether you type in or select or send somehow, uh, give a, a command to CSON that no, compile that piece of text or start now with that instrument, then you can do it. And uh, we developed a kind of a test system with uh, a Japanese programmer, Toshi uh, Kita, and um, prepared it for the Boston. We had a small uh, um, demo about it. My idea for the piece was that um, um, there would be one person on spot playing on uh, MIDI keyboard, the famous uh, choir of slaves uh, from uh, Verdi's Nabucco. So all these poor people who uh, somehow must be in slavery or in some other uh, reason uh, uh, can go to uh, uh, see sound. And also uh, the text of, of this choir that, uh, uh, begins with the words that uh, fly fought on its golden wings. So I think well, it, I found it very nicely symbolic uh, and connected to uh, the development of C-Sound. And so the idea was that one guy is just playing on MIDI keyboard and then all the other guys from different parts on the planet send in the instruments that he is going to play. So he has no idea what is com coming out and or what is going to change. So um, there's one small uh, demo of, of, of that. But it was quite uh, fun, fun to do. Uh, but what is behind it is actually a very powerful way of, um, of communicating. And um, because sending audio over internet, it's, uh, uh, you need a lot of uh, good internet and a lot of bandwidth. And, uh, and it's a kind of expensive thing. But send text messages and have them see songs running in every computer, or, or you have one computer and then send the one stream. It's uh, a cheap in the way of, uh, in the uh, sense, uh, 
that. And after the conference, we had up a, a test server running, actually it's physical somewhere in Ireland, and then people were testing it and sending in instruments. And it was so fun at all. And I'm not sure, uh, Victor, but I think maybe it was the inspiration for the UDP uh, connections so that CSON can now yeah. receive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. It's a great thing. And well, then also, <laughs> uh, well, it's, can, I think it's not used so much, but it's very powerful that you can have also locally one computer that is uh, running C sound or many of them. And then you send information about and trigger different things to happen so you could build an extremely powerful C sound <coughs> cluster, if you wish, so that it can be uh, influenced and controlled over network, not only by OSC or other messages, but you just can to the all CSON stuff using uh, that solution. Uh, next example I would like to show you <coughs> is one system that I'm uh, very proud of. Um, again, with our ensemble U, we were thinking in parallel time almost about uh, the, the light metronome. And, and at first, I built a system that we had a physical lead blinking on the stands of uh, a musician so that we had red and green and blue uh, lids blinking and then C sound was um, sending message to them. And this is one side that uh, C sound really helped me also to think about it uh, is the um, very strong side of C sound to have the score so that you can um, think in time so it's not just a um, kind of uh, patched synthesizer that runs and do things according to the connections, but you can really program what happens when, and you have, can have the tempo changes and uh, the events, uh, see some events, they are very close to, uh, you can match them with bars in a uh, traditional score. And slowly, then step by step, uh, this uh, project for years, then uh, I've developed a system uh, called eClick, and it's a, a wire-free click-track system, and uh, there's one central computer that has the encoded score of that piece. It's written in uh, CSON, in the uh, CSON score. And basically, every bar is one instrument call, and you can do uh, extremely complex bars, and tempo changes, different formatas, and so on. And then this, uh, it's sent over Wi-Fi to all clients, all people who have that uh, system behind. I'll show you the mechanics. Now this is the server program. So now this is the thing that uh, users are having on their stands. So you can, you are, I can see the bar and beat numbers. And well, I have it here. Yeah. And in uh, some certain pieces, it's of really big help. And similar thing could be used in uh, uh, in also in the pieces of like the Zale when you need a click track, but <laughs> you have just <laughs> two pages or, or less. Um, and um, I would like to play you now a piece with that system um, by Peter Ablinger, a great. Uh, German, Austrian uh, composer who has uh, worked a lot with uh, noises and, and then very sharp and clear kind of experimental ideas, but, but still a very good composer and, and the way he uh, works have all details out. Uh, the piece is called Piccolo und Rauschen. So the piccolo and, uh, well, not noises exactly, but uh, some kind of rumbling, the humbling, and then so I don't know. How it, it, Better way to try. 
translate Russian. No word for it. <laughs> yeah, okay, anyway. <laughs> but Piccolo is Russian uh, for uh, Piccolo and uh, um, the sounds. And what uh, Abinger does here is uh, <coughs> using just band pasts, white noise. Uh, it's a short piece, but has um, uh, like two and a half minutes, something like that. But it has uh, six small movements. The numbers kicking there. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I spoiled your experience. <coughs> but um, of course, your yeah, listeners shouldn't have it. But um, um, yeah, this thing is available in uh, uh, GitHub or uh, the. Uh, it's a cross-platform and it's free to use. So the only trick is how to write the, the scores. But yeah, so if you uh, feel it for any project, then feel free yeah. to download it and test it. I'm very uh, grateful if there is any feedback and then to see how, how it works for you. And yeah. now to continue the previous talk about the uh, um, intercontinental music making that when we actually really made it happen uh, and was uh, last spring, no, no, two years ago. And, uh, the similar system like we are with a keyboard player, but now um, a little bit more sophisticated uh, for one concert. Um, as an instrument, we uh, used um, the headsets that are measuring uh, brain waves on the musicians. And also some uh, skin conductance uh, um, uh, sensors. And the idea was to bring people together and to connect some things that is very deep in us, so that the brain activity that you actually can reach 
uh, nowadays. And then, uh, well, your friends were very far apart, so that connect these things very hidden and very far things to, to music. And they used uh, the similar uh, system about uh, C sound, running C sound instance, and then uh, of instruments or uh, new uh, calls coming in. And we had a, a system up on a concert. So you can see uh, uh, here three persons uh, standing with their heads, and the two uh, uh, connected with their cables, with their skin thing. And audience could see the brain waves changing on the screen, and here are the season messages uh, uh, coming in. <coughs> and the system was running in my computer on the spot. And well, people uh, from, uh, well, also from US and Ireland, and uh, Stephen and Victor, and I think Rory and Ivan and who else were playing there connected. And then we had. Uh, almost real-time uh, <coughs> audio stream going up so that people could uh, listen how it goes. Um, and it was really great fun to do something together. I can, I can play you uh, maybe a small example. It's not, again, it's, it's not a thing you to listen to exactly because it's so much about the experience and there's their excitement. But, but still, but was, uh, especially in the rehearsals, and it, it sounded really good. Maybe a score or something. Maybe it was not the most interesting place that I've scrolled now, but, but yeah, anyway, um, what was the greatest thing about was the, the happiness of people. We, we could really make something together and, and this excitement. And also the situation where the performers who are, um, tr used to be in <coughs> control on the sounds, their task was try to uh, concentrate their attention to maximum, keep it as long as they can and then relax completely. So that uh, it's a quite different task what the musician does on the uh, stage otherwise. And I would like to uh, end the presentation by one piece by Anna Bates. I was uh, uh, lucky, uh, uh, I'm grateful that he could come here. Uh, it's for flute and electronics. The first version is uh, realized uh, with a uh, Max MSP. It's using um, uh, flutes, multiphonic, and then using different uh, uh, band pass filtering and then different effects to uh, play this piece. I rewrote it now uh, using C sound because I don't own a Max and with a runtime, well, I'd also I cannot control things, I change things if there is something. So I went through uh, rewriting it and would like to play the piece for you. It lasts about seven minutes. And when <coughs> we, then it will be one o'clock, but if you can stay and if you have any questions, then I'm, of course, glad to answer. But now, a uh, uh, course from the floor, but <coughs> by any rate.
I would uh, up here the last slide with my contacts. If you have any questions, um, uh, thank you very much. Out the links or send me an email and. Uh, Thank you very much, Tyro. That was some fascinating ideas contained there. And I think if you're really shown very well, I see sound. We can't really describe what it does anymore, uh, and that it really can be whatever we want it to be, whether that be just as, as a, a means for conducting us as performers, or for turning our pages of our score, or for creating some kind of communication uh, around the world. It doesn't really have a sound or, or a function. It's it's the old cliche: the, the, the limit is our imagination. Of course, it was wonderful to hear some pieces as well, so thank you very much for those. But uh, maybe there are some questions people would like to ask. Um, I'm just going back to your first piece, Studio of TV. Um, you mentioned that you were doing this for Sport, and I just wonder how the meditation is formulated into the Z-Z, like how the Z-Z works the notation. No, no, no. It's um, uh, the score by the composer. Yeah. Uh, just coming in. Okay. From or taken from PDF and, oh, okay. and, and so an image. It's just an image. Oh. Yeah. Perhaps you can. Uh, you, well, you seem to be coming up with kind of pretty interesting and uh, <coughs> wonderful ideas. Um, perhaps you could give us a, a taste of like what's it, what are you currently working on? Just curious. Oh. Is it? Um, yeah, if there is something. Uh, not on my table, but in my computer. I'm preparing uh, for on uh, sound installation uh, for an exhibition by quite famous, and very, very smart uh, Estonian painter, and um, <coughs> it's going to be two large paintings in a huge hall in an art gallery, and um, it's called Oratori Estonian Oratorio. And then it has the beginning of Estonia and at the end of Estonia. And um, <coughs> there's going to be two well, sound systems. One of them, the beginning of Estonia, is going to play a large wall and then a picture of some of the first inhabitants uh, arriving to the shore of Estonia, but in a, in a kind of a perspective and a little bit way. way. And for sounds, I decided to use. Um, <coughs> Contact uh, loudspeakers behind the wall, so they would put uh, the wall plane, and so there are six of them. And uh, the speakers uh, will play uh, different notes that I have played in with flute, so different families of uh, motifs. And then it's going to use huge hollow rhythms, a kind of phase shifting techniques, so that they start together, all these points, and then. Uh, go a uh, slightly apart and then sometimes you get some of them together and then after half one and a half hour together again and so on. And plus some filtering and, and echoes going on there. But the idea of that work was that how to uh, support uh, the feeling of the perspective so that there, uh, you're somehow zooming into the history, you're somehow drawn to that uh, picture and then the sound so that if you come closer to that wall it becomes much different. So when you need a quite room for a tour, then it's, it's like one thing, but if you come closer, then you hear the sounds going in and then uh, also the echo going back and forth for the wall. And also important part uh, for me um, is that I'm going to play um, in new uh, motives, uh, new yeah, samples of, uh, well, new, new motives every morning. So every day will be uh, different. And it will be streamed on online also. It's easy. Yeah, yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and the next, the other, the end of the stone is going to be uh, one second of last chord of the stone in first oratory or it's reverberating the whole, and then it's going to do some spectral processing and it's kind of that sound. The kind of squeaky and an uh, uneasy way, but that's not it. Thanks, So I have a question about your brain game, to come back to that, and two comments in particular you made about it. First of all, that you had decided to keep, or not decided to keep, that you used pictures of the brain waves and also the sea sound code um, as visuals. And then secondly, you, you suggested that 
there wasn't necessarily much to listen to, that it was more fun for the participants. And I'm, I'm just curious whether subconsciously or not that this was something you were aware of in the process of creating the piece and therefore the visuals were there to enhance that experience for the, the listeners? Well, maybe in that case, I, um, I put stress on the wrong place, but uh, no, in, and in that uh, piece of work, the sounds were the protagonist, the main thing. Mm, I thought that maybe that, to listen to that example more here, it doesn't make so much sense, but, but here, creating sound is for the first task, and other things uh, uh, supported it. But what I meant was that it's a very different experience when you are in the hall and listening it and are also excited about the quite complex theory how things are happening. So you can introduce it. But why what was the decision to keep the kind of the C sign code on the screen, for example? It was definitely a part of that work and also the visual side was important and so that you can see the things are coming in and you can see the names of the people who are sending the code and, and so you get the feeling that there are actually real people behind it. So it's just that it is a core work between well it's so it is not faked or just computer. Yeah. And would it, would it have been an easy process to make that perhaps a little bit more without suggesting that CSAN code is not a beautiful thing, I'm mm -hmm. sure it is, but might it have been an easy, easy thing to create a more visually appealing kind of interaction with CSAN? I must admit I know practically nothing about it. In that work, no, because it was a very straightforward, honest thing. This was this message came in, and it was kind of CSAN chat, and I liked it very much in that way. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, if I heard you right, uh, Ed Bates' piece, the original, if you like, was written entirely in Maximus P, and you just did it in sort of CSAM. I suppose that comparison, or what made you kind of think, oh, I want to rewrite this in CSAM, and <laughs> be it kind of go to that trouble, or and I suppose what, what worked better or worse or differently between the, the two environments? Well, the need is, uh, <laughs> the reason is just the need, because I'm using a Linux computer and it's uh, well, you can, you can use uh, max runtime, but it's not that reliable, and I just wanted to have my thing that I know how it works, and I can control it if I need, I can change something, and that was fair. Otherwise, the fetch is there. And so, so they're pretty much, they're pretty much identical in terms of the... I don't know, because yeah, yeah, I mean, I think pretty much. I mean, um, sustaining effect is just looping and playing back at high speed, and there are tremolo effects, and some, a little bit of tape as well. So they're the kind of things that you can do with different languages. Um, they were pretty much equivalent. I think there's a slight yeah, subtle yeah. differences, but it's more like a different instrument for a piece, maybe, and kind of a uh, rearrangement almost more so than anything else, which is quite interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. I a precision floating point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tom, I, I just wanted to say, those of you, uh, thank you so much for playing the pieces and showing us some of the systems. What excited me so much, and I don't think anyone in the audience you could get it without, he, he's saying it to us in, when you're in the hall and you experience it, but I was blown away at the conference in, in St. Petersburg when we played Tarmo's piece. And uh, we all had our iPhones, and we were all, because what he had done with that was we could see the part we were playing on the screen. So you weren't just, making noises and imagining, oh, I guess that's me, oh, or whatever. You, you were actually getting a display on the screen so your initials would come up and you'd see a little bit of your melody and then you'd sort of hear your melody. Maybe it would come a little later, maybe it would come earlier. And so you all became in the audience part of the orchestra, and like friends, like, oh, hey, that's Tim, that's Tom's melody, that's my melody, that's... And it was like a community, it was unique for me in the way it all worked so perfectly. That feedback we were getting, and then of course what Tarmo was doing, we saw in the photograph him playing the flute along too. So then what he added to that was his own improvisations based on our melodies to kind of glue the whole thing together. I think that 
for me, that was such an exciting example of this new kind of interactions that you're building and doing um, uh, that um, I hope that you get a chance to do play his pieces and experience that. But I, I think it's, it's, it's uh, amazing how well that works. So I'm, I want to testify how great his work is. Two, I then want to ask um, how you think how much you think about the audience's role and and how much you're really building that into the piece, uh, into these pieces, you know? I mean, is that was that a unique, just, it just worked? Or it's working and I've been working, you know, you told us you made these number of pieces. So just, um, you know, if you would tell us a little more about where that comes from, what that thought process is to, to make sure the audience uh, is aware of their role. I think it's so important, and I think you've you've really hit it in, in your work. And, and uh, uh, I had him play the piece. We did it with my students at Berkeley, too, over the internet. A little different, and, and that was a blast, too. So they were thrilled. But, but thank you. It's some very important point that you really uh, brought out, clearly. It's the feeling of uh, being together, of this community feeling. And it's a very strong thing. And it's a little bit missing in the normal uh, concert atmosphere that we have the separation. And, uh, and to uh, get this feeling in, in the many of my works, it's, it's one of very important things indeed. Now, how to um, cope or how to uh, not guarantee, but, but uh, still somehow to prepare that it will sound good? Uh, it's a lot about thinking, actually. This is what, um, so, there must be systems that somehow um, constrain the possibilities and somehow take care of that, that that would sound all together well. And yeah, it's a second thing, what you say, it's really important that the people who play in the orders so they can understand, okay, this is me, exactly to say. And in some sound games it works worse, in some better. But this is an extremely important point. And it's a lot of thinking to prepare that. And quite, quite much programming to prepare the sound games. But the feeling for me as a performer, mm, last uh, sound game in the series we did it was called uh, a Briefing Game. And then we had uh, <coughs> some uh, smartphones. Mm. No, first of all, I built uh, some instruments, some tubes, with pressure sensors in it. So when some people were uh, just inhaling and exhaling. So that a couple of people who were just... And then uh, the system is reading the pressure and playing some harmonics in different systems. And some people were kind of breathing with their smartphones with their accelerators, so they're just moving and up and down. And then, well, we did it together. So we had my bass flute, and we got the breathing in and out, same rhythm. And then there were three sections when people could play what they want with different instruments. And well, the feeling was great at first. Well, to get this the, the same uh, breathing with audience. And first three sections that came, they, they were quite a mess. So people just were trying out things and playing what they wanted. But then after three or two or three sessions, the, the three sessions became really making music to them. So I understood that the people in the audience, they were listening to what they were doing. And they were listening to me. And I was reacting to, to these sounds. And this, this was actually a very strong unique feeling for me that I was really playing together with people in the audience. And I believe it is actually the same thing when it works to play the written pieces. But it's just the question of view and the standpoint, how, how you take it. And uh, I'm <laughs> doing my best to, to bring people to that understanding that uh, they are core creators of the uh, concept experience. Right. I'm here until 3 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have any questions. <laughs>